Okay. It looks like we are live on Facebook. Sweet. We have three people viewing. Awesome. Okay. Let's get this thing started. Uh, welcome to our sports panel held by Kinetic Edge. My name is Patrick Ford. I'm a doctor of physical therapy with Kinetic Edge, and I'm the lead physical therapist out of our Waukee clinic. Thank you so much for showing up today and for hanging out with us while we have a really awesome discussion about everything sports injury related, rehab, recovery, management, and return to sports. Uh, we're going to have a great time tonight. So just sit back, ask some questions. If you have them, we will answer them as we get to them. And if we don't, we'll send you a message and try to answer it as best as we can. Uh, tonight, we are going to field those questions through the Q&A. So if you're on our Zoom call, you can go down to the Q&A section, put the question in there, and we'll be able to see it. Otherwise, if you wanna sign up for one of our free injury screen opportunities, you can go into the chat and just type out the clinic that you want to be seen at. And our great uh, friend and coworker, Cassie, will field that information from you and get you set up as early as tomorrow. Okay, so tonight I wanna to introduce you to a few people. Uh, we have Erica. Erica, go ahead and give us a brief intro, who you are, uh, what clinic you work at, and uh, your background. Yeah, so my name is Erica Ganan. I'm a certified athletic trainer. Um, I don't actually work in really any of the clinics, but I cover Pella Christian High School in Pella. So I have a fun opportunity to work with high school and some middle school athletes there. Um, my background is I went to Central College for athletic training. I've worked in athletic training. This is my fifth year. Um, I've covered different high schools and some colleges in the area. Um, some of my favorite sports to work with are definitely football, basketball, um, and wrestling. So that's just a little bit about me. Awesome, thank you very much. How about you, Carol? Um, I'm Carol Kelderman. I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Um, Background-wise, I'm in the Oskaloosa Clinic. Um, background wise, I worked in orthopedics <clears throat> for about 23 years, um, love to work with all types of sports. Um, but runners are one of my uh, favorite populations to work with. Um, also overhead athletes specifically related to the shoulder. Um, and then I have some expertise in pelvic health. So the pelvic and hip area and how that kind of affects the lower extremity. But as far as schooling, I went to the University of Iowa, and then I got my doctorate at Creighton University. Carol, you went to Creighton University? I did. I did not know that. That's awesome. <laughs> Diploma right here. Awesome. That's great. Uh, Katie, how about you? I'm Katie Hall. I'm a doctor of physical therapy out of the Des Moines Clinic. Uh, my history is I went to Univ the University of Northern Iowa where I did athletic training. I'm a certified athletic trainer. Um, and then I went to uh, Des Moines University to get my doctorate of physical therapy. Um, athletic training, I worked with all sports that the college has at the D1 level. And then I've worked in a, just a smattering of covering different events after that from wrestling to youth tackle football and things like that. Um, in the clinic, I... From, through personal injuries and other things like that. I really enjoy working with hip injuries and a lot of lower extremity things. Um, in Des Moines, we see a lot of runners and then everything from gymnasts and swimmers to um, soccer players. We see a good variety. Yeah, great, thank you very much. Uh, Tim, how about you? Yeah, my name is Tim Vanderwilt. I work in our Ames clinic. I'm a physical therapist and I was an athletic trainer certified in 2001. Um, I like to work with all, all sports. Um, I've always been involved in sports uh, my entire life. So it's just fun to get a variety of experiences. But I also um, like to work with golfers because I am a golfer. Um, and then I've done a lot with runners too. So kind of an interesting combination, golf and running. But um, it's fun to work with both populations. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of uh, people working with runners with this group. I think we mm -hmm. have some of the most experience with that in the Des Moines area. 
Um, me personally, I work out of a facility called Sportsplex West. They do a lot of baseball programming as well as volleyball and basketball. Um, I work with a lot of overhead athletes through that. Uh, I work a lot with runners and my personal interests include kind of CrossFitters slash fitness enthusiasts. Um, so I really enjoy uh, integrating my strength and conditioning perspective into rehab as well. Uh, we do have some people rolling in. So I wanna remind you guys, if you do have questions, you can go down to the Q&A if you're on Zoom and put the questions in there and we'll read them and answer them as we go. And if you're on Facebook, you could just put it straight into the comment section and we'll try and monitor those comments and uh, read them and answer them as we can as well. Okay, I think uh, let's get straight into conversation here. So before we talk about like any type of specific injury, I wanna go back and really talk about what should somebody even do if they experience an injury, I feel like a lot of people might think that they have to go straight to the ER or they need to go and get some imaging at the outpatient clinic or go and see their primary doctor. So um, can we talk a little bit about the steps to take when you first start experiencing an injury, who you should go to and uh, when you need to take the next step um, and get maybe an uh, uh, a imaging or surgical consult? Um, how about Tim? Tim, can you start kind of answering that question for us? Yeah, um, I think, you know, physical therapists are definitely equipped to, and athletic trainers too, um, are equipped to uh, assess those injuries, uh, soft tissue, um, you know, anything that is related to sports, um, we're, a good, we're a good place to start. Um, you know, we're, we, and obviously at Kinetic Edge, we do free injury screens. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, we get um, clients that come in um, with those specific sport injuries and we can kind of triage them, meaning we can, you know, figure out what, what the next steps are. If, if physical therapy is appropriate, if going to a physician and getting some imaging is appropriate, those are, um, those are some of the things that we screen for and look for. Um, and we've been trained to do that. Um, I think all of us would agree that um, we probably have uh, probably the expertise to understand where that next step is. Yeah, definitely. And I definitely agree, like working that triage process and taking them from the injury and doing a quick assessment on determining how um, intense the injury is to the tissues and to their body. Uh, I think we do a great job at that. Um, so when somebody experiences an injury, let's say we have a football player, they're on the field, they experience an injury to their leg. What are things that they should be looking out for as far as, is this something that's dangerous and that I actually physically got hurt and injured tissue versus something that's like, hey, let me wait until tomorrow. I can go and see Carol and she can help me out. Uh, Carol, can you answer that question for us? <clears throat> well, I think you know the athletic trainers that we have on the field, um, are really good at helping assess that situation, whether it's an emergency situation where they need to be um, even transported or have a parent um, take them. Um, those kinds of things need to be dealt with a little bit quicker. So that's one reason we have athletic trainers there um, on site. Um, as far as past that, um, some of the things that would help them determine is, you know, how much disability do they have? Like, um, how well are they functioning? Um, you know, the severity of pain can sometimes weigh into that as well. Um, so those are things that they can kind of use to determine which direction to go. Um, typically, when they come into the clinic, then we can kind of take the rest of that, like Tim was saying, and, and look um, at whether they need a referral. And the great thing is we work um, as large teams with the rest of the healthcare team. We don't see ourselves in isolation um, that we're gonna take care of everything. Um, but the really cool thing about when we are able to see somebody um, initially and they're appropriate, um, they get started getting better right away versus the delay that can happen um, when they end up kind of chasing a rabbit trail. Yeah, and that's a great point that you made at the beginning too about how important it is if there's an athletic trainer on staff trusting their process of going through their 
checklist on what's going on. Erica, can you describe that to us a little bit? Because some people might see an athletic trainer out there and they're like, what are they even doing? What does that look like from your perspective? Yeah, so from an athletic training perspective, um, whenever an athlete gets injured, there's a couple of things. One, you know, the first thing to do is calm someone down. Whenever someone gets injured, they always have that heightened sense of something is wrong. Um, they can't always put a finger to it. So we're working on calming them down, um, figuring out what's wrong with them. So mechanism of injury, um, you know, where they landed on, did they hit their head on the ground or did it have whiplash? Different types of mechanisms actually can help us determine how bad it's gonna be, um, what the next step needs to be. Um, for example, I'm trying to figure out a good one. Had quite a few broken hands this year. So looking at the hand, are they able to move the joint completely? If they're not able to do it initially, sometimes I wait a couple of minutes and see, okay, is it just the shock or can they start moving it again? Um, so give it a couple of minutes, see if they're able to move it. If they're not, then that's when you take the next step to determine if they need to go in to get x-rays or if it's just a jammed finger. Um, but definitely looking at it from okay, is it something that can be handled on our own or is it something that needs physical therapy? Is it something that needs a physician? Um, I always tell kids too, there's three things I look at. You know, are you gonna get better by doing nothing? That's a very, very seldom thing usually if they get injured. Um, but if you sit and do nothing, will you get better? The second thing is, um, do I think you see a physician? Is this something that as an athletic trainer, I can't handle as a physical therapist, um, not able to handle? And the third thing is if, exercises, if strengthening, if stretching, if um, working on mechanics, which is a major thing for athletes, if that's going to be more beneficial. So kind of giving them the three options, weighing in, you know, what's going to help them in the long run. Um, injuries don't just affect you now, they affect you for the rest of your life if you don't handle them properly. Um, those are the different aspects I would look at with athletes on the field. Yeah, that's a great, great kind of overview there. And I think you did a good job of talking about our role in assessing function, especially immediate after like an acute, right in the moment injury. And we do actually have some evidence and research that gives us guidance on how we can assess that pain like Carol was talking about their function and give them a pretty accurate determination on if they need imaging or not. Mm -hmm. We have multiple areas of the body that we can do that type of process on. What some people might not be sure about is, well, what if this is something that's developed over time versus something that just happened? Um, Katie, can you comment a little bit about something that's kind of developed over time that's more of something that is we would typically call a chronic issue? So I feel like physical therapy is a great avenue pursue in, to pursue initially with subacute or chronic issues because we are the movement specialist. So if it's something that's preventing you from moving the way you wanna do, um, like you said, we do injury screens where we can kind of determine what's the cause of the injury, what kind of issue, what kind of activities are aggravating to it and where you're at in the, the rehabilitation process to figure out where we even need to begin. If it's something that maybe we feel like hasn't been addressed and is needs imaging again, we can refer out for things like that. But a lot of times, um, it's like, like, like Erica said, going back and looking at mechanics or where, what is the tissue lacking tolerance to, or what are the mechanics that are recurrently causing tissue aggravation? A lot of times there's things that just the person themselves, they're not able to be aware of that. And we can kind of be that outside eye to see, ah, this is the missing link. This is why this is a recurrent issue and it's not getting better um, and help them work through the process to get to where we're actually healing as opposed to just chronically re-aggravating tissues. Yeah, that's, I think those points that you said, tissue tolerance, right, aggravating factors, we're not talking about necessarily that an injured tissue is going to stay injured for injured forever. It's talking about how is the body processing this information and how can we help facilitate that and move it along a little bit quicker, a little bit smoothly. And I think that also kind of bends into another topic that people have questions about is like, well, I just feel like I, I need an x-ray. I just need an MRI and it'll tell me what's going on with issues, especially those that are more like chronic, persistent, uh, subacute. Why is that not necessarily the best route to take or not as reliable? A lot. So there's a variety of reasons. Um, for one, they're expensive. They're really expensive. And a lot of insurances companies have come to recognize that. And so some insurance companies will actually make it. So you have to see a physical therapist 
for some level of plan of care before they'll even approve one. Um, there's also the thing, I mean, not just because we see things on imaging doesn't mean that that's what causing your, your symptoms. And that can be really frustrating mm -hmm. when you see that you have an issue that maybe 70% of the population has, but it's not actually what's causing your pain. It's more um, tissue sensitivity and the way you're moving or a lack of strength in an area. So sometimes it's actually scarier despite the fact that that's not what's causing your symptoms necessarily. Yeah, that I think that kind of overviews it perfectly. And we actually do have a, a question related to this topic. Um, they said, when my son was uh, had a complaint of back pain, we went to the family doctor and the diagnosis was actually missed. Um, they actually went and had an appointment with an ortho who gave them the correct diagnosis. What they're asking is that it, it sounds that if, if we suggest that they, br they bring their child to us first, we can help figure out who to see and then we could hopefully get a correct diagnosis. Um, do you guys feel like that statement is correct? That if, if we're the first line of defense in an injury of any type of complaint of pain, whether it's sports related injury or another type of pain, do you feel like we are the ones to go to, to help figure out what is the next step in the process? Is this something intense enough to go see an ortho or another specialist? Uh, or is this something that we can manage with physical therapy? How do we, kind of sift through those, what we call yellow and red flags to figure out, is this something that's coming from the back or is this something that we're not quite sure about? Carol, can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, so we have a lot of tests that we, um, they're called special tests, things that we look at, see um, along with the history, um, again, kind of like um, Erica said, the mechanism of injury or, or maybe kind of what brings on the pain or what brings on the symptoms. Um, looking at that big picture helps us to kind of determine um, along with, okay, what has there been any imaging done so far? If there hasn't been um, and they're starting to get some of these yellow flags, especially if there's some red flags, um, then we're looking at, at going on to additional, whether it's imaging or consultation, um, but there are certain things that tend to um, show up in our examination and because of our musculoskeletal expertise. So because that's our expertise, um, often we are able to, to kind of determine some of that. Occasionally it comes down to um, severity as well. So if, if the symptoms are pretty manageable, we may, you know, try certain things and then the response to those things will also give us um, the information that we need. Lack of response oftentimes means we need to move on to something additional as well. So we don't usually drag things on, um, but uh, make sure that the response is uh, what we would expect. Yeah, and I think to answer that question a little bit further, to go off what you're talking about, we mentioned red flags. Um, just to clarify, red flags are things that we mm -hmm. look for that might tell us that we uh, can't necessarily get all of the answers or totally reduce whatever symptoms or restore function. Um, we need a little bit more input and we use the symptoms and your report to us to guide us on who to refer to. So if you have back pain and then we ask you if you had a recent stomach bug or if you're also having issues with um, bowel or bladder problems, then we say, okay, maybe an ortho or us isn't the right person because this might be tied to those symptoms. And you mentioned this too, Part of our job, and I feel like one of the first things I think about since I am so uh, musculoskeletal movement minded, I try to go on to the other things and say, what are the things that I can't treat? And let me make sure that this isn't one of those things first. Let me make sure that I'm the person for you to see. And if I'm not, then we refer you on. So hopefully that answers your question from the chat here. Um, I think we do a good job of trying to triage through those things that we, we feel like we aren't as good as attending and uh, helping recover from, as well as finding what point in the musculoskeletal rehab recovery uh, type of medical field do you need to see? Is it us? Is it an ortho? Um, is it just rest, like Erica said? Okay. So I feel like that covers that kind of basic injury knowledge section pretty well. And I think we'll start to dive into more specific body injury areas and talk more about the management, the mechanisms of how these things occur um, and what we can do to help rehab. And then 
maybe even prevent these from happening in the future. Um, if you guys don't mind, I think we just start down by the ankle and kind of move our way up the body. If more questions come in that have a specific area, we'll try to prioritize those since these people have been kind enough to come and hang out with us. So I feel like ankles, number one thing I see from athletes is an ankle sprain right? Football players, basketball players, soccer players, volleyball. It almost doesn't matter where they're coming from. Maybe not golf, Tim, but I did <laughs> see some guy dislocate his ankle while doing a backpedal on a golf course. Yeah, professional golfer at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But ankle sprains, right? Uh, what is the most common type of ankle sprain and how does it happen? Erica, can you comment a little bit about ankle sprains, especially your experience seeing them uh, on the field or re in real time? Yeah, so ankle sprains are very, very common, especially in younger kids. Um, most of the time I see it, especially when they're developing, when they're growing, I call it the very awkward long leg, long arm syndrome because they're not able to use their body like they are used to when they're shorter and then they get taller. Um, the most common is definitely the lateral ankle sprain. So they roll their ankle in. Um, and a lot of times, you know, kids will be like, oh, I rolled it. I'm going to keep walking on it. They don't do anything else about it. They may buy a brace. They may just get it taped. Um, and the pain never really goes away. It always kind of lingers there. If they don't tape it, don't brace it. They just keep re-rolling it over and over and over again. So one of the biggest things as an athletic trainer, I have the privilege of at least working with athletes in schools, at games, um, and then also seeing them sometimes in the clinic as well, but working on strengthening, working on balance, um, working on proprioception, knowing where your body is in space. A lot of people don't really know how to manage. Okay, if I'm running and I'm cutting, like playing basketball, how do I stop myself from letting my ankle just keep rolling when I'm trying to take a step in a different direction? So I do a lot of working on balance, working on balances on hard and soft surfaces, working on ankle band strengthening, um, even just range of motion if that's limiting and that's causing them to have ankle issues, um, all that fun stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. I think the, the coordination is such a big part of that, building the strength and the balance and the awareness, like you mentioned, to help control that ankle. And then sometimes accidents just happen and you hit a weird spot in the ground and you just kind of mm -hmm. topple over. Uh, Carol, do you mind commenting about the initial phase of that injury and what we can do as therapists to kind of screen out anything that's insidious or that needs imaging? Yeah, so initially when, you know, when there's an ankle sprain, um, we, we try to kind of figure out a little bit about the severity of the ankle sprain, um, but there are certain areas that when, um, when they're really tender, um, especially up along the bone on the outside, um, sometimes even down into the foot, um, as well as, you know, again, that, that lack of being able to put weight on it, those kinds of things. Um, those follow some specific rules that would be an indication for an x-ray. Um, once we kind of get past that, we can do um, kind of start with kind of an early protection phase, but technically that doesn't necessarily mean like all out rest. It usually means relative rest. So we're, we're resting from certain things. And of course, a really mild um, ankle sprain kind of rolled the ankle a little bit. A lot of times they'll be able to get some tape, you know, reinforce the area and, and kind of continue on for a little bit. But um, like Erica was saying, um, just pretending it's going to heal itself, go away. I'm just going to get off of it for a little while. I'm just going to brace it. Um, I'm going to go back. Doesn't usually, it, that's where we get those, you know, quote unquote, chronic ankle sprains. Um, they just don't completely rehab. And um, those little sensors that we have in our joints and, and the soft tissue that kind of tell us, help tell us where we're at in space, um, oftentimes um, have some issues after that. And it is really important to retrain it to help prevent that chronicity or that chronicness of it. So. Yeah, and, and it's important to mention that with ankle sprains, there is tissue injury, right? The ligaments that are supporting sure. your ankle get stretched or even potentially torn. But even with that, that doesn't necessarily qualify for somebody to go and get surgery right away, right? These are things that people can actually just live with. And if they know, if they have good guidance from a therapist or they know the initial steps to take and kind of 
be able to calm themselves down. And right after the injury, they could kind of help understand, hey, Carol said, if I can put some weight on it, that's a good sign, right? So now I can start thinking, okay, this is something that's a little bit less serious. And then even if they're like at home, like literally I just sprained my ankle a week and a half ago. I was stepping off my treadmill and I've sprained my ankle maybe five times now over the course of 10 years. And I just hit it at the right angle that it didn't really know what to do. And it gave out on me and I kind of was freaking out at first, but then I calmed down and I said, okay, can I move it at all? Check that box. And then I kind of stood up and I was like, how does it feel to put a little bit of weight on it? And then checked the back that box. And then once I knew those two things, I felt a lot better that I was like, okay, I'm all right. I just need to give this a few days. I need to go back to what exercises I know will help me regain my motion and get me back to doing what, what I like to do was just like exercise, lifting weights, running, stuff like that. So my ankle's much better now. Okay. Um, Katie, can you comment a little bit about how do we work to help prevent these? Like, what are the strategies that we're going to implement to maybe stop or, you know, slow down these recurring injuries from happening? So, yeah. So if you've had an ankle sprain, one of the best things to do is to get in and get it dealt with right away, because there are things that happen immediately for your ankle to protect itself. And then if you don't do anything and we're coming, we're coming into the rehab process months down the road, your body's made some adjustments. So made it, so it makes it so you can keep doing life. And a lot of times those adjustments aren't necessarily helpful <laughs> to the activity that you want to do, whether that be your calf gets really tight, or maybe we're making some changes at our hip. Um, your body's done things to heal itself. So it's laid down some scar tissue and how your body lays down that scar tissue isn't always the nicest, prettiest way that's the most supportive to your activity either. So we retrain the tissue tolerance to loading for whatever activities you might be trying to get back into if you're going to be going into activities involving side to side cutting and pivoting. That's gonna look a lot different than a person whose activity is walking or things like that. But we wanna get you back to the, the tissue loading the way that you need to load it. And also, again, talking about the, the proprioception and the neuromotor coordination, that's the brain talking to those joint receptors in your ankle and the muscles that control your ankle and making sure the timing of that is efficient. There's not a delayed response. We're not, it's not after you're already into that hairy position of your ankle being kind of rolled in and a delayed muscle contraction to pull you out of that. It's just a lot of, reprogramming the brain and the muscles to do their job because usually after an injury like that there is a, a delay or some hesitancy for that to happen um, and that's how we get into that chronic pattern is there's the delay that the scar tissue isn't necessarily st as strong as it could be and your ankles tighter than it was before the initial ankle sprain so it's you're just kind of set up for this recurrent pattern of injury yeah, uh, that's all all great points is that it's like we need to get it prepared and try to overcome all those things that happen after an injury occurs, right? And we did mention bracing, and I feel like people make the mistake of buying those elastic braces that kind of just slip over the ankle and it feels nice because it's compressing and kind of keeping it secure um, and, and tight. But Tim, if it were you, what kind of brace would you recommend that people get to help them at least in the short term or during intense activities to help prevent sprains? Um, I think the, the lace up brace, some of those have been effective. Um, there's also uh, some more stable braces that have a little bit more support on the outside of the ankle. If it's really flimsy and it doesn't have a lot of support, those things aren't going to give you much uh, support in general. Um, I'm personally not, um, obviously when they first initially injure, initially injure their ankle, it's good to brace um, just as a protective response. But um, I really encourage people to try to get off of those braces as soon as possible because you want your body to react kind of like what Katie was saying about um, let, allowing those muscles and the um, nervous system to kind of catch up and do what it needs to do. Um, but yeah, some of the braces that, like you were saying, Patrick, the elastic ones, they're not going to give you any support at all. Um, so I, I think if you're, um, going to have something that's going to protect, you need something that's a little more rigid, um, initially. And then if you're going to be more active, um, something that's a lace up, that's going to give you some more support and, um, like with sports, especially if, 
volleyball players, you see a lot of them have the lace up braces that can kind of help um, maintain those positions. So when they step on somebody else's ankle, it's not just going to automatically roll in uh, when they have um, those incidences. Yeah, definitely. I think if, if you're going to get a brace, get the right one and know when and where to use it, right? Um, for anybody that is just joining us now, I just want to remind you that you can feel free to ask us questions whenever. If it's about specific injuries that you or someone you know has experienced, feel free to add them in and we will get to those questions as soon as we can. We're kind of rolling through, starting at the foot and the ankle. We're going to move up to the knee now and everybody has heard of ACL tears and MCL tears and meniscus issues. And these happen a lot, especially in cutting sports that we talked about that some of these ankle injuries happen. Um, when we're looking at somebody coming off the field, uh, how do they, they originally usually get these types of injuries? Um, Carol, can you talk a little bit about the mechanism of how an MCL, ACL, maybe meniscus tear might happen in sports? Yeah, well, all of these things can, obviously occurred together. Um, they kind of refer to it as an unhappy triad. Uh, certainly we hope that we don't have all three, <laughs> um, but sometimes that happens. Um, a lot of times the knee is kind of driven in and even like hyperextended. Um, a, a twisting motion often occurs when, especially when there's a, a meniscus tear, um, which is kind of a cushion padding in the knee. Um, and so when those things happen, um, yeah, the, it's, it's usually a, a pretty significant injury. There's joint swelling. Um, so other than the meniscus um, and the um, MCL, the ACL is one of those that helps provide the stability um, in the knee. And so when the knee goes beyond kind of that range that that's a, able to stabilize, um, then we end up with some tearing there. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like those twisting, cutting, changing direction movements that just put the extra strain right beyond what it's able to tolerate. Um, that's really how these are going to happen. And a lot of times it's things that you can't prevent. And if it's, especially if it's a contact injury, right? Somebody kind of rolling over your leg and it just moves the wrong way and it happens. So we talked about these things a lot of times just happening as an act, accident and something that we can't always try and, and prevent fully, but maybe we can make the body a little more robust. And we know with ACL tears, once you get one, your risk of re-injury um, post-surgery can increase, especially if you return to sport too soon. Um, uh, Tim, can you talk a little bit about that timeline? When should people be returning to sport? Do they need to practice a little more patience or can they kind of get right back at it right when they are able to start running? Well, um, it kind of reminds me of a story. Um, there's a guy, If um, I live in Ames, but I'm a Hawkeye fan. So, um, But Brandon Snyder, he was a safety at the University of Iowa, and he had uh, torn his ACL. Um, and I think he, I can't remember the timeline. I think it was less, it was certainly less than a year that he was, he came back to the sport um, and he retore the same ACL. Um, generally people will need, you know, especially if they've had a recovery time, um, you know, if they've had the surgery, um, a year, um, is, is probably appropriate, uh, to come back. Um, no, you cannot return to your sport immediately when you start running you still need to, uh, re-educate the muscular system, the nervous system, um, cutting, planting, jumping, landing, all those things need to be trained before you can really start to return to your sport. Uh, most of the time when people are just starting to run, uh, their bodies aren't prepared to do that. So, um, you know, generally rule of thumb, um, and in Brandon Snyder's case, it was really probably too early. I don't know if anybody else remembers that or remembers when he went back, but I think it was around uh, nine months after his surgery that he went back and retore his ACL in the first game that he played um, in uh, his return. So, yeah. 
And it's super important to say, you can get back to sport, but so many people, I mean, it's, it's a tough process to go through and you hit six months and you're like, okay, am I ready yet? Like, can I do this? I feel great. But you're like, well, we've only practiced running at this point mm-hmm. and running is a straight line movement. And we know the mechanism of injury for ACLs is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. There's even some research out there saying like after nine months, if you wait another month, you reduce your re-injury risk by 50%. And then another month after that, it's another 50%, 15, uh, 50%. And if you do that for up to a year, you're going to be in a good spot and you've given yourself the time to build up your strength back and get your coordination back and practice some real-time sports-specific maneuvers and activities. Katie, what kind of parameters are we looking at when we're trying to determine? Somebody comes to you, they say, okay, we've gone through this. It's like month seven, month eight. Like, am I ready? What are we going to look at to determine if they're ready? Depends on the sport that we're trying to get back to. Obviously, if it's if it's basketball or volleyball, we're going to look at, you know, what are your landing mechanics like? For what, what do your takeoff mechanics look like for a jump? And what do your landing mechanics look like? Do you have the power to get off the ground? Does your body have the, the shock absorption capabilities for you to control that knee just with a straight jump, let alone a jump with a twist or a jump to the side? Um, we need to look at, can you run forward and backwards? Can you run side to side? Can you pivot over that leg? Um, what happens if we start changing the surface? So if we put you on an unpredictable surface, something squishy or whatever, and now we're tossing a ball at you and your attention is a little bit off. Are you going to be able to control that knee kind of more on, on a subconscious level or are you still very much in the I have to think my knee needs to be in this position because that's not sport. So those are the kinds we, the kinds of things that we really need to look at when we're getting back to is can you handle some of the unpredictability that comes with competition? It's yeah, not that's just practicing, but it's also the when it's not against your teammate and you don't know exactly what they're about to do. Right. It's like, do you meet the minimum requirements to even participate in the sport at a leisure level? And then we also have some like specific testing that we can do to Mm -hmm. see, is it side to side? Like how are we looking at the affected leg versus the unaffected leg? Can you talk a little bit about that testing that we do, Katie? Yeah. So a lot of times we'll do, so there's a variety of things we can do from single leg hop tests, triple hops, things like that. And we want to see that your strength, your distance that you can hop, your control is at least 90% of that of your, your non-involved leg, typically. Right. So we're, we're comparing a lot of different things to the leg that wasn't affected. And we want to see that it is pretty close to the leg right. that never went through the injury in the first place. So, Right. And, um, and anybody can chime in here. What is the importance of an athlete feeling ready for a sport? They might pass all the tests, but do you feel like they're perception of how they're going to do if they're nervous to return do you think that plays into their risk of re-injury it absolutely Absolutely. does (laughs) right it's like we need to give time to build the confidence and Mm -hmm. get you maybe some some easier experience getting into this maybe we just start with you practicing by yourself just dribbling let's say it's soccer you're dribbling a soccer ball you're playing maybe some one-on-one drills you're going through cone drills you're getting on the field and getting the experience of what it's going to be like mentally to be in the game because you want to be certain that your body can do what it can when somebody who's healthy gets on the field they don't have to think about those things is my knee gonna do this when i'm when i'm playing Mm -hmm. that thought needs to be as far away from you as we can get it so we can be comfortable in your confidence and to re- in your ability to return to that sport. So I think that's so huge. It's like, where is your self-esteem at? Like, are you ready for this mentally? If you're not, let's find the steps that we can take to get you there. And that's another so knowing the, the uh, person's sport and understanding like what their body needs to be able to do to go back to it. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of things in the clinic in order to prepare them for that. So, um, I do ask that those confidence questions. That's actually part of our return to play uh, protocol. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're really challenging them pretty heavily in the clinic um, to the point where, um, yeah, they're working really, really hard and doing a lot of really challenging things when they're in the clinic. And so um, we're building their confidence right alongside what you said, Patrick, where we were talking about, you know, just, um, integrating back into pieces of the sport. So, you know, a lot of times, um, and it depends on the type of sport, as Katie said, you know, if it's a level one sport, something that's requiring a lot of cutting, um, pivoting, 
that's going to be a little different um, where somebody else might be able to go back more quickly um, with less risk. Um, we do know that if they pass their return to, to sport um, battery, they have a much, much lower, like I think some of the studies I've seen are like five, 6% um, re-injury rate versus like 38 some percent um, for those that, that didn't pass. So, you know, really important. And then the timing too is making sure that, you know, we're not rushing them back to sport. Yeah, I think that's great to have that as part of the protocol. And I feel like it makes people feel more reassured that it's like, hey, we know your sport. We know the requirements of your sport. And we're going to make sure that not only are you physically prepared, but you're mentally prepared to get back into it, too. And there's even some research out there saying even as early as when somebody gets out of, uh, let's say they get surgery for their ACL and they're just on the quad set portion where they're trying to get their quad thigh muscle to fire. If you show them a video of some somebody playing soccer and you say you squeeze that quad every time that person kicks the ball that actually gets their body to recover quickly and you can get them more into those situations at least mentally where it's like oh that was the exact situation I was in when I got injured and now I'm practicing what my body needs to do to overcome that type of situation so I think early exposure even if it's just watching a video or having time where you're just mentally kind of meditating on those types of things while you're doing your rehab I think can go a long way especially over the course of 12 months right okay is there anything else that you guys want to mention about ACL rehab repair um, return to sport criteria yeah, one more thing. I was just thinking of this, um, yeah. especially from the athlete perspective of trying to explain to them the importance of not hurrying back into it. Um, have a lot of actually family um, that have retorn ACL. So <laughs> kind of knowing kind of that back part of it too and the injuries in general, but the education from our aspect to whoever we're talking to is major, making sure they understand the importance of um, we need time to heal. We need time to get them back to what they want to do. And the biggest part too, especially with ACL tears, any kind of knee surgery or reconstruction, um, knowing, explaining like the bone modeling process, how long it takes for the bone to heal and the graft to close. Um, so it's not just, we're trying to hold you out of sports. It's explaining why it's important to wait. Um, Cause a lot of times people are like, well, I feel great. I feel like I can go back out there, but not understanding that well, if you go out there, your bone hasn't fully healed on the graft and you can just go ahead and tear that right away without it fully healing. So um, especially from an athletic training perspective, I always try to explain the whys of why we do different parts of the rehab, why um, waiting is important. Right. One thing I'd okay. mention is, um, you know, along that same line is um, they've been looking at the idea of copers versus non-copers. And basically that just means, um, you know, people who are relying more heavily on those ligaments versus those who are relying a little bit more on their muscular system and their ability to control that. Um, so when we're talking about post or after an ACL reconstruction, it, I think it's interesting to note that you can really train someone to become a coper. Um, and so that's part of our job too. We know that the opposite limb has an increased risk of having an ACL tear as well, um, just based on some of those factors. And so um, as physical therapists, we're, we're looking at, you know, what's going on with that other side as well. And so at some point in the re retraining process, we're retraining the other side um, as well. And it, 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 there comes a point where often their, their ACL reconstruction side starts to get a little better in their balance and control. And so it's time to catch up. I know probably all of you have seen that um, over time. And so I think it's good to, to note that besides training the brain and, and all of that kind of thing, we're looking at that whole person and trying to reduce their overall injury risk as well as their re-injury risk. Right. And I think that point about copers and non-copers is a good um, discussion point to talk about. Right. Does everybody even need a surgery for their ACL? There's a lot of athletes that you're like, you're getting to a high intensity sport and we need to kind of get this process along quickly. 
But there's some people that after the immediate injury, we could actually wait a little bit of time to see how their body is recovering and see if it's moving in the direction that tells us, hey, your, your body's doing a great job. Even if you're scheduled for therapy or for a surgery, we might be able to even put that off even longer to make you go into the surgery even more robust. And potentially you won't even need it, especially if you're somebody that is doing something that's like not a, not a contact sport or not a cutting and diagonal changing sport. Right? Some people just walking down a hill, they hyperextend their knee, they tear their ACL. It's like, you might not have to go through the process of even getting a surgery. So coming to us to help you understand what's going on with your knee, even before surgery, I think is a super important piece um, to mention that, again, even with an, a suspected ACL injury, I still feel like we're the number ones to go to outside of something serious that needs to be dealt with immediately. I think prehab is drastically underrated and kind of underappreciated right now. But yeah, if you go in with better neuromotor control of that joint and swelling that's under control and improved range from after initial injury, your outcomes improve a lot. I think that's something that yeah is underrated. Okay, I think we have a little bit more time to talk about one more topic. And personally, I feel like I hear so many people say that they have tendonitis in their knee or have tendonitis in my elbow, tendonitis all over the place. Um, let's talk a little bit about what truly is tendonitis and why we actually start kind of calling it tendinopathy and why it's important to know if it truly is a tendon issue um, and how that guides our rehab process. Tim, can you talk a little bit about an itis versus an opathy as far as the tendon goes? Yeah, tendonitis is uh, usually more of an acute injury. Uh, it usually happens in a shorter period of time. Um, tendinopathy is, it usually happens over a long period of time and there's some thickening of the tendon, uh, the tendon where it attaches to the bone and even um, down close to the musculotendinous junction. So basically where the tendon and the muscle come together. Um, part of that is a breakdown of the, either the tendon or the muscle near the tendon. And uh, the body is trying to lay down more scar tissue in that area. So the tendinopathy over time, you've developed more and more um, scar tissue or just uh, healing stages that have happened over a long period of time. Um, and the tissue just continues to break down, then heal and break down and heal. And so then you develop uh, thicker tissue in that area. The blood supply usually is not as good um, to that area. Uh, so people generally will develop that over time. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you had in mind besides that, but no, that's um, perfect. I think that that short term just recently started to get tendon pain. Probably we could tie it to a specific activity or bout of extra activity that they're not mm -hmm. normally used to doing. How does the management of an acute tendon issue differ from somebody who has something that is suspectedly probably more chronic that they say, yeah, this is something in my knee pain just kind of comes and goes each year. Um, Katie, can you talk a little bit about tendonitis rehab versus tendinopathy? Tendonitis rehab is there is actually an, a, an acute inflammatory process happening. So we do need to kind of calm things down, back down a little bit, allow for healing, and then gradually return to the previous level of function. By the time that something's gotten to tendinopathy, like Tim was saying, a lot of your body's tried to, it's initiated the healing process and not successfully completed it several times. So now it's the tissue tolerance to whatever activity you're doing, it just isn't there. So we need to go look more at the mechanics and then actually load the tendon more, much more than we would in an itis situation. Um, it's a lot of, it's a lot more, um, again, when, when the body heals things, it's kind of haphazardly in terms of how scar tissue is laid down. So we need to stress that in a variety of ways, to make it so it can handle the activity that is recurrently aggravating. Right. With that so itis, it's rest like, versus load. <laughs> right. Like the itis is like, let's get over this initial healing phase. It's likely only going to take about a week or so. Mm -hmm. Let's do the smart things about kind of decreasing the intensity of any activities or decrease the aggravating factors that that might go through. And then, you know, a short time after that, probably even within a month, 
it's like we could probably get over this and be done with the rehab right. versus an apathy we might have to deal with for a bit longer than that we're trying to make the remaining portion of the tendon that is still has good solid tissue even more robust and changes like that to change tissue we even talked about this with the acl it takes time to make those changes um, and like you said with something like an itis we're probably not going to put you in a heavy back squat if it's in patellar tendonitis. Um, we're probably going to be a little bit more gentle with it, let it calm down, and then gradually bring back the activity versus an apathy. Maybe we're like, let's load this thing up as much as we can until you say cutoff point is right there. It's like, we need to put some weight on you and get some stimulus to this tendon because that stimulus from the weight or the activity is what's going to drive the change in the tendon. Um, what types of exercises might, might me, we include with a tendonopathy rehab, Carol? Well, it depends on where the tendonopathy is, but um, initially, even with a tendonopathy, you know, we're going to gradually reintroduce stress. Um, so we're looking at kind of that um, stress load um, that we kind of dose out just like medicine. We, we dose that stress so that we can stimulate that remodeling process to close that healing loop so that the tissue can take the stress. The other thing I'm usually looking at when I'm looking at kind of exercise prescription for that um, is not necessarily localized to that area. There's usually a reason that that started in the first place. Um, so if it's the elbow, you know, what's going on at the shoulder? What's going on at the, you know, hand? Are we over gripping? Um, you know, do we have uh, things that are too far away from us? Um, do we need to change the mechanics of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, from the knee, you know, let's say we need to get back to squatting, you know, let's say we have a crossfitter that wants to get back to heavy squats. So we may not completely take the squat away, but we may reduce the range of motion of the squat. We know that certain weight shifting positions, different types of squats put in different amounts of stress. We may go to a single leg versus a double leg with a load in order to help reduce the stress, but increase the activity of the hip. Again, looking at the neighbors and saying, how can our neighbors help out in this, <laughs> in this scenario? So the neighbors of the knee being, you know, the hip, the foot and ankle, and kind of looking at the big picture and saying, why did this start in the first place? And if we're going to be successful, we might need to figure that out um, while we're doing this closure of the healing loop. So that, that would be kind of like what we would look at from an exercise prescription standpoint, big picture. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. It applies all over the body. It's like, we need to change the load scheming, the range of motion we're using and look at the other regions to make sure that we're giving those the treatment they need to. And from an athletic training perspective, how do athletic trainers help in the management of these uh, type of tendon injuries, Erica? Yeah, so especially a lot of knee tendon issues that I've seen, especially in the last couple months, um, explaining to kids, and um, I have the privilege of at least working with a strength and conditioning coach at the school as well, um, so I'm able to go in and watch them lift. If it's the lifting causing issues, I go watch them practice to see if it's the practice causing them issues um, and seeing what exactly is going on. Like Carol was saying, it's not always that body part causing the issue. It could be if it's the knee, it could be the hip, it could be the ankle. Are their knees caving in when they're lifting because their hips are weak? Are their ankles insta instable and that's causing their knees to have issues too? Um, do they have a muscle imbalance? Do we need to work on strengthening? Um, and so a lot of it is educating the patient, watching them, giving them corrections that they're able to do, um, whether it's, I use a lot of mirror work. So watching yourself instead of just guessing where your body is. Um, so they can see the cues or giving them a band around their knees so that they can keep their knees out when they're squatting versus letting their knees cave in. Um, different things like that to help the tendon recover fully because um, tendons take the root of the muscle and the joint. So if they're constantly doing the same thing over and over again, aggravating it, how can we reduce that aggravation over time? Yeah. 
I think that's great. It's like, let's look at your technique too and give some time toward that. And I think one thing that we should definitely mention too is let's look at how these things reoccur with you. Like what is the pattern of the activity that causes these symptoms? And what so many times for me, what I see is that um, let's take weightlifters, for example, that they're working on their bench press and they get some pectoralis tendinopathy in their shoulder. And I'll ask them like, what's your training like been like for the last four weeks? And it's like, yeah, I've kind of been taking it easy, but then I wanted to test out my one rep max this day. And then you kind of hear that story like, oh, how did it happen last time? It's like, yeah, I think I was going heavier again, but I wasn't really used to doing that. It's like, okay, well, maybe we need to help you understand how to program your training so that we give you more of a gradual load instead of just kind of going for random one rep max test days or really heavy sets out of nowhere. And that same goes with activity volume too. It's like, what have you been doing all summer? Oh, nothing. And then I just jumped into football practice when we started in August. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> I think I understand your issue. Maybe we need to give a few months of some training or at least some weightlifting, some time in the gym to build some more robust uh, muscles and tendons and joints instead of kind of just jumping into an activity uh, that your body's not ready for. Okay, I think that covers tendinopathy pretty well, at least on a baseline. And that I think um, all of you have given really good perspectives as far as what are they gonna see when they're actually at school practicing from an athletic trainer strength and conditioning perspective? And then how are we gonna manage these in the clinic to get them back? For anybody that is still here with us, thank you so much for hanging out with us for the last hour. We'll give you guys a minute or two to fill in any extra questions you may have that we can answer really quick for you. Otherwise, you guys can go back and listen to this whole thing of us rambling on about injuries for another hour. Um, and you can contact any of our clinics to see a therapist that can help you with anything that we talked about today or anything that we weren't even able to mention. Um, we don't only deal with sports injuries, we deal with all types of pains and aches uh, from head to toe. So if you do feel like you need a opportunity at that free injury screen, go ahead and put some information in the chat. Afterward, if you think, oh, I missed out on an opportunity, just go to our website, kineticedgept.com. You can find the clinic that is closest to you, contact that clinic, and they will get you in as soon as we can fit you in. So if anybody has any questions on Facebook, put them in the comments. Uh, on Zoom, you can put it in the Q&A. We'll give you guys another minute here. Um, again, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I had a great time with you guys educating me all about these injuries. Um, it really helps me to, to talk about this stuff more often, so. Alrighty, no questions coming in. Got a few people on Facebook still. Again, quick referral over to kineticedgept.com. That's where you're gonna find the contact information for all of our clinics. Erica's out at Pella. If you wanna go hang out with her, you can go see Carol over at OSCE. Tim is up in Ames. Katie is in the downtown clinic and I'm at the Waukee clinic. We have, other, we have clinics also in Centerville, Colfax and Newton. So we're all over central Iowa. We're certainly a place that you can get access to um, and we would love to see you out there if we haven't seen you yet. If we've already seen you, we would love to see you again if you need our help. All right, <laughs> let's shut this down, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I um, hope you guys have a good night and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Bye.